Good evening, everyone, and welcome to The Real Science Exchange, the podcast where leading scientists and industry professionals meet over a few drinks to discuss the latest ideas and trends in animal nutrition. The Real Science Exchange is brought to you by Balchem Animal Nutrition and Health. Visit Balchem.com to see how Balchem's line of encapsulated nutrients and chelated minerals can impact your bottom line. Hi, I'm Scott Sorrell, one of your hosts at The Real Science Exchange. And tonight, we're kicking off the new year with our January installment of the Journal Club. Styled after the traditional journal clubs convened at universities across the country and around the world, we'll take a closer look at some of the newest research published in leading scientific journals. This segment is scheduled to air once a month. We will welcome Dr. Bill Weiss, Emeritus Professor from The Ohio State University, to the pub where we'll discuss the uh, selected papers that were recently published. To gain additional insight and liven up the discussion, we'll also invite the authors to join us whenever possible. Tonight's discussion focuses on phosphorus in the fresh and transition cow diets. Clay Zimmerman, my steady co-host, take it away. Bill, welcome back to the exchange, and thank you for taking on this role for our journal club. You're becoming quite a regular here (laughs) at the exchange, (laughs) and we are so thankful to be going forward with this monthly special in 2022. What's in your glass for tonight's conversation, and who did you bring to the pub with you? Actually, it's just water in my in my glass today <laughs> because I have to go some do some driving. Uh, my guest today isn't an author, but he's uh, probably an international expert in what we're going to talk about, and that's Jesse Goff, who's now retired from both USDA and Iowa State. He's uh, he did research at uh, Ames mostly in calcium and and milk fever issues and then he taught at iowa state in the vet school he's been retired i think about two years i can't remember that but still very active so welcome back to the exchange dr goff what what is your drink our choice for your for cold Um, january evenings i'm as bad as bill i'm drinking water (laughs) and uh i decided to forego the the diet pepsi because when we're talking about phosphorus this is another issue for humans, too. <laughs> oh, that's a good point. That's a good point. Well, so our first paper uh, for this evening is the effects of dietary phosphorus concentration during the transition period on plasma calcium concentrations, feed intake, and milk production in dairy cows. Um, and it's by Kane Thau et al. from, from the Netherlands, from, uh, the, from Utrecht University in Wageningen. And it appeared in the um, in the November issue of uh, the Journal of Dairy Science. So the link for this paper will be in the show notes for our listeners. But before we dive in, what I'm drinking tonight is a Dave and Danny uh, hard apple cider from Kansas. So Bill, now let's talk about phosphorus and why did you choose this paper? Well, one is, you know, hypocalcemia is still an issue. Um, we, we've learned a lot and I, I see, I still get lots of calls on, on problems and, and phosphorus, I think is kind of an overlooked nutrient with respect to hypocalcemia. Um, and there's been a series of paper. The other paper we're going to talk about is also is just out, but in the last few years, there's been a series of paper highlighting the importance of dietary phosphorus in in preventing hypocalcemia. And that's kind of why I I asked Dr. Goff, because he's done actually a lot of work on this, and it's not quite reinventing what he did, but he's identified this as an issue as well. So so we'll focus first on on the the paper from the Netherlands. So, um, Jesse, would you like to give us an overview of this paper? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> the bottom line is don't feed phosphorus to your dry cows. <laughs> but, but actually, uh, Thomas Schoenwill is the corresponding author, and uh, he's done a lot of work on magnesium uh, and how important it is to prevention of milk fever. And now they're following up with some work, which is also follow-up to stuff that was done many years ago. The idea that excessive phosphorus is detrimental to calcium balance. And of course, uh, we were all told in school, at least I was told in school, that calcium and phosphorus uh, 
bind to each other within the gut and they become this insoluble salt that won't be absorbed if they're out of balance. And we need a certain balance of somewhere between 1.7 and one. And it, it, it's, uh, it's become plain that it's a lot more complicated than that. Um, so in this paper, they basically fed uh, either what they called an adequate amount of phosphorus or what they called an low phosphorus diet. Adequate was about 0.36% phosphorus and the low phosphorus was 0.22% phosphorus. And then when the cows calved, they either kept them on a adequate phosphorus diet or what they called a low phosphorus diet. And I think they were pretty similar, about 0.38 versus uh, 0.28. Am I remembering that right, Bill? That, that's correct. And uh, and then they, they thought maybe they'd look for interactions between uh, pre-calving low phosphorus and post-calving low phosphorus. To me, and, and maybe Bill, I should let you summarize too, but the bottom line was that uh, the animals on the low phosphorus diet have substantially lower blood phosphorus than the other cows, not, not unexpected, but their blood calcium concentration is actually improved uh, when they're on the lower phosphorus diets, particularly when the pre-calving low phosphorus diet Although there was a small effect of keeping that cow on a low phosphorus diet, even post calving. But yes, you know, the thing in the new NRC, their low phosphorus would just meet the new requirements. So that, that was just almost, uh, well, I think the new requirements was 0.2 and they were at 0.22. So essentially feeding to the requirement reduced uh, uh, or increased blood calcium, feeding excess phosphorus, decreased blood, uh, blood calcium. One, one question I used to get a lot from veterinarians is low, low phosphorus post capping. We see, we'd see this and a lot of times I'd say it's maybe it's highly related to the intake. They're not eating enough phosphorus. So these were quite low. I mean, or, um, yeah. you know, one of them dropped as low as 0.8 for, a, for a, 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 a day seven. Is that an issue or is these cows designed to handle these short term? It bounced back within within a couple of weeks to normal, but for a week or two, it was really low on the low phosphorus yeah. diet. Well, so so I'm a veterinarian. <laughs> we're taught <laughs> we to take- We won't hold that against you. So. <laughs> no. We're taught to take blood samples and make pronouncements, right? And unfortunately, a lot of, uh, most cows actually will have a small degree of hypophosphatemia when they calve. Um, part of that's a reaction to the low blood calcium that almost all cows have. Um, not enough to cause milk fever, but it's low. And un unfortunately what that does is it turns on parathyroid hormone, which causes the salivary gland to kick out phosphorus into the saliva. And if a cow has any kind of hypocalcemia, the ability of the phosphorus to move from the rumen to the small intestine is going to be inhibited. And primarily phosphorus is absorbed from the small intestine, not the rumen. And so at, we often see these low blood phosphorus in a fresh cow as a result of parathyroid hormone reaction. Um, is it enough to worry about? Uh, I'm going to say no. But you do have this thing called the hypophosphatemic downer cow. And as you suggested in this paper, when they fed the low phosphorus diet during lactation, they actually had a few cows. And this, this average was at seven days, was down to uh, 2.17 milligrams per deciliter. That's really considered very low. But the hypophosphatemic downer cows we wouldn't see them go down until they were down around 1.0 milligrams per deciliter. So it's substantially lower than even what they saw here. And as you said, they start bouncing back fairly quickly once they put a little more phosphorus back in their diet. So then you, you wouldn't, uh, if these, these low phosphorus, which were, were again, met requirements, they, we call them low phosphorus, but they would essentially meet uh, the new NRC requirements um 
aren't 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 an issue if just because of low phosphorus. The, the the benefit in calcium would over overcome any issues with their be greater a bigger advantage than these lower lower blood phosphoruses. Yeah, and I think uh, yes, particularly in the pre-calving diet, that low phosphorus issue really isn't something I'd worry about. And in, in fact, another line of evidence. Uh, uh, Barb Barton did, did one of the original papers showing that phosphorus feeding to a cow inhibited production of 125 vitamin D and caused the cows to get milk fever. They were feeding somewhere in the area of uh, 80 grams of phosphorus per day to those cows. Wow. And, and, and like 90% of them got milk fever. <laughs> it, was, it was incredibly powerful. And then Tom Kachura did the same type of a study, only he went the other direction, tried to feed a very low phosphorus diet. And when he did that, they didn't, they didn't get milk fever. Um, so this is old stuff, but everybody still was always worried about, hey, these blood phosphorus are low. The veterinarians are pulling their hair out saying you got to feed them more phosphorus. Yep. Yep. And then there were the old papers. And Bill, you remember we went through this with the 2001 NRC. All those old papers saying you're affecting reproduction when you put, <laughs> oh, yeah. put uh, when you try to restrict dietary yeah. phosphorus. But what they failed to think about was that those papers, the restriction of dietary phosphorus, went along with the restriction of dietary energy. Right. Yeah. And that's really what was causing the repro problems. And, you know, another issue is, you know, with DCAD, there, we tend to feed high calcium diets. And again, this old two to one phosphorus, you had to feed two to one. Yeah. And so if they were at 1% calcium, a lot of people were feeding 0.4% phosphorus just because of that. And, you know, as you said, that ratio really <laughs> doesn't mean much. And you meet the requirements of both. And there, it's, it's, it's approximately two to one, but that doesn't mean it's that's what you need. You just need to meet the requirements. Well, and out in the field, I, it's not an experiment because I've never done the experiment, but I ran into it out the field enough where there's certainly still a, a thought that to make a low DCAD diet work, you have to have very high calcium in the diet. Yep. And uh, I'll run into diets out in the field that are 1.7, 1.8% calcium. And unfortunately, I think they've also adopted the idea that the ratio might need to be higher. So yep. you see above 0.4 percent i do i see a lot of that too. and i think to some extent that undoes the good of the low decad diet another proof of the pudding that that phosphorus keeping blood phosphorus above a certain level is critical is the uh the uh diets that they've been using the calcium binder the exolyte zeolite um the product can work quite well under some conditions. Um, but if you look, those cows have extremely low blood phosphorus yeah. levels. Yeah. And uh, it may be that that's part of its mechanism of action is to actually mm -hmm. bind phosphorus. Similar, similar to what's being done when you feed a very low phosphorus diet. And, so, and so, th so these were actually um, pre-calving were, were high DCAD diets, right? Yeah. They, they, they were yeah. plus 300. Yeah, yeah the, the Dutch paper was plus 300. The other paper is a little more moderate, plus, plus 50 or so. Yeah, the, this, this main, the paper discussed mostly now was, I think they were using the low calcium, ignore DCAD. They fed low calcium, but I think, what, 0.35 or something calcium? Yeah. Yeah, point, yeah point, point uh, 0.36. It was point yeah. three six. So, the, yeah, so for that... For the high phosphorus dry cow diet, the, the calcium and phosphorus were equal. Yeah. Yeah. A little take home from that. Okay. 0.36% calcium is pretty low calcium. But if you look at the results, how many cows got milk fever? It was a lot. Yeah. <laughs> about a third. Third of the cows were clinical. Yeah. Five out of 15. And then, uh, yeah. And, and so that tells you 0.36% calcium is not... <laughs> a low calcium diet that's going to prevent milk fever. Yeah. It's, it's, you have to get much lower than that. And that's, that's where the zeolite type binders, when they work properly, they bind up enough calcium to give it the equivalent of something, say a 
percent, 0.15 percent calcium diet, maybe, but it has to be much lower than that to effectively prevent milk fever. I might, might just add the new there. This, you, I punched these cows into the new model, and its calcium requirement was a little bit less, 0.29 percent. But you're That's, saying still may not be enough. But these were were not based on new NRC. These cows were not defi- even marginally deficient in calcium. They still were yeah. slightly excess. Well, and, and then uh, so if I fed 0.29, should I expect milk fever to go away? <laughs> no, so. I'm, I'm still <laughs> I'm still at the requirement. Yeah. And how how far below the requirement do we have to get to get yeah. substantial turn on of all those systems? If you look at those old papers, uh, Howard Green did one of the good ones, uh, uh, Rich Goings. There were there were a number of groups. You guys at Ohio State were doing some of that, uh, the old Hibbs and Conrad type papers. Uh, they had to get calcium extremely low to make that work, something on the order of less than 15 grams a day oh, being wow. fed. It, it was really low to make it work effectively. How can, how can you feed that in a practical diet? You you screw up a lot of other things. <laughs> yeah, it's it's almost impossible for a, in the Midwest to get a diet even at 0.25 percent calcium is almost impossible. Yeah. What what about what about the you know this 0.22 percent phosphorus? I mean, so they were they were not adding any inorganic no phosphorus to this. Can how achievable is that with? with the typical diet it's you know part of the problem with this um you know byproducts tend to be high and they're cheap and they're high in phosphorus so people tend to feed them and that's another reason i think we we do see relatively high phosphorus dry cow diets you could without a lot of work at all and with the feeds we had available in ohio i could get in in the low 20s low point twos i couldn't get below point two but i could get point two two point two three but no byproducts at all. I couldn't feed any byproducts, no soy products, which you don't really need. But it, it it's feed, it's possible. It, it takes a little bit of formulation, but it was possible for the feeds we had. These would be straw-based diets, of course. Yeah, the straw the straw helps a lot. But yeah. uh, as as Bill suggested, and this is what I'm what I'm running into the field quite often is uh, canola meal, mm-hmm. extremely high in phosphorus. Yeah. compared to soybean meal and yeah. soybean meals no prize it's still pretty high and there's got to have some protein from somewhere and then uh uh brewers yeah. you know you can get oh, wet yeah. we can get wet brewers in that's cheap and it's low in potassium well yeah it is mm-hmm. but uh it's so high in phosphorus you got to really be, be wary of that yeah. and distillers, even yeah, distillers, distillers issue so so be on the lookout for how you may think you've got a low phosphorus diet when in fact, because you haven't added any dye cow or anything like that, right. but uh, be aware that there, there's some bright byproducts that really bring in a lot. And I mean a lot, I think canola is what's just close to 0.6% phosphorus. It up, but it's high Pro- proteins, oil seeds in general are high. Yeah. Canola is higher than soy. I don't know where cotton seed, meal fits in there but it's probably yeah. high as well it's pretty high too so uh soybean of, of all the proteins soybean may be among the lower end of the of the phosphorus spectrum if i recall right but you can check that in the nrc <laughs> that's right so, so, so i did walk through the calculations on a gram basis for for our listeners you know that are looking at grams of calcium and phosphorus if you if you looked at the last three weeks of the dry period and those dry matter intakes the um they were averaging 48 grams of calcium on both diets because that you know they had equal amounts of calcium um in both dry uh dry cow diets the the high phosphorus diet was 48 grams yeah. per cow and the low phosphorus is 28 grams a day and you know the, these cows were eating a lot. I think we're up around 14 uh, kilograms prepartum. Right. And that's another benefit with straw. You know, we we talk about concentrations, but straw can reduce intakes so that the grams per day is also also reduced. So that's another big benefit of these straw-based diets on on mineral metabolism. So Jesse, on uh, it would be able to uh, if people are looking at the paper, it's on page one one six five two. 
it's the uh, the plasma inorganic phosphorus concentrations. Yeah, yeah. So that that really low that 0.7 percent. It's 0.7. Yeah, 0.7 millimolar. Millimolar. That's the, which, uh, which would be about 2.1 milligrams per deciliter. Okay. Okay. So that was. Uh, those were the cows that were on the high phosphorus during the dry period and then the low phosphorus during lactation. Is that, yeah. is that level an issue, that low level? Well, like I said, we'll see cows drop, but and that's a low drop. But the fact that they recovered quickly and they didn't report any issues. Like I said, when we saw the clinical hypophosphatemic downer cows, they were usually somewhere around one milligram per deciliter, which would be uh, 0. 0.3, 0. 0.31 okay. Uh, okay. millimolar. And, you know, in, in the real world, that combination won't happen very often. In other words, you're not going to have no. low. It's easy to get high, high phosphorus postpartum. So right. the low, the low, low wasn't that bad. If they fed low, low prepartum, low postpartum, those blood cap, blood phosphoruses really weren't that bad and they bounced back very quickly. How important, and this was kind of addressed, this was a, a, a non-DCAD diet. If this was DCAD, Jesse, how important do you think phosphorus is in, in these types of diets, in those types of diets? Well, I, I like I said, I, I don't know if anybody's done the experiment quite that way, but out in the field, we're running into situations where the DCAD is quite low, uh, but they keep the phosphorus high. Now, often that's in conjunction with a high calcium diet too, but we've seen that they're still not preventing all these milk fevers. They're still having breakthroughs, more than just a few breakthroughs and the cows uh, aren't doing that well. How It's complicated because some of these cows aren't eating either mm -hmm. because of all the, all the calcium and all the anions being added. So it, it's a little complicated by that, but I'm convinced that uh, if we can get the phosphorus out of those high or high anion diets as well, we're better off. I is, just, there, uh, is there any evidence or data saying that DCAD would affect phosphorus requirements? I'm not aware. No, of any, okay. I can't, I can't think any, but, uh, but here's a, here's a good one. <laughs> and uh, Bill Sanchez will probably shoot me after I tell him, but, he, he went to, to an ADSA meeting uh, and he had an abstract at this. I don't think it's ever been published, but he had called me up and said, you know, phosphoric acid is a really good acidifier. <laughs> so they started feeding phosphoric acid to the cows. And I said, you know, we, we did that a long time ago and that's what we use to induce milk fever. And he said, well, well, how could that be? It's acidifying. And sure enough, that's what he found. It was a terrific acidifier, and cows love the taste of phosphoric acid. It's just like I drink Diet Pepsi, right? I love that, love that taste of acid. But uh, apparently, that phosphorus level got so high that they induced a lot of cows to get milk fever. So that's uh, be, a, you know, it, don't be tempted by the thought that it's an acidifying acid to use it for prevention of milk fever. So that, that was never published, Jesse? It's in the abstract. You can still probably find the abstract. Let's was that the year it was in Oregon? Might have been oh, the year. Oh, okay. Did. It's a long time ago. Back though. back in the nineteen nineties. <laughs> I guess. Yeah. Are we are we becoming that much of dinosaurs? <laughs> <laughs> back in the nineties. <laughs> we remember that stuff. <laughs> So I mean that that would if if there's no reason to think DCAD affects phosphorus and I I agree I don't think phosphorus requirement then this paper would say feed the requirements and you'll be okay which would be again around that 0.2 percent level yeah and even with DCAD would be where people probably should be I I think so no. and and there, your problem is your problem is that it's very rare to find a practical diet where you're feeding enough protein and other things that you're going to, you're going to be bouncing too hard against that requirement. Yeah. You're, you're usually, your problem is trying to get below 0.3%. Yeah. I said, we, we could, with ours point, point below 0 0.25, I didn't have much trouble below 0.2. It would have taken some special ingredients. So, so how much straw are you feeding bill? 
It would be about forty uh, percent of the diet and corn silage, um, and then not much else. I mean, there'd be a little corn grain, very little. We would these proteins, a little bit of supplemental protein, no byproducts, and we, I'd be probably right at about twelve percent protein. So no, no, not a high protein diet. And now here's the next question. You ready? Because I run, <laughs> you're uh, you run into it too. I'm sure. Well, I got heifers in there too. Yeah. So. Yeah, and it, this we should point out these. This paper was just multi parous cows. Okay. So, but yeah, if you got it, then you start having to feed some some protein. If you got heifers in there, more protein, fourteen percent, then it gets harder. I still think it. You can get it around 0.25. You don't have to be at 0.3. You can still get it at 0.25 with some select ingredients, but it's it's more difficult. Well. Just don't get above 0.4. <laughs> that's, right. that's, that's where we're really seeing the issues show up. And, uh, uh, you know, it's it, uh, many years ago, there's, an, there's another paper. It's in the Journal of Animal Science. Uh, our lab did all these experiments in swine, too. And we showed that as dietary phosphorus increased, this is George Engstrom and Travis Lildike, as dietary phosphorus increased, the activity of the renal 1-alpha hydroxylase that makes 125 vitamin D decreased uh, linearly. So it, it, was a, it was a strong relationship, very linear. Uh, so getting phosphorus as low as you can removes that inhibition of the 1-hydroxylase. Mm -hmm. And this uh, another paper we're not going to discuss where they fed very low phosphorus and clearly even probably deficient phosphorus diets pre part and they actually got an increase in uh, 125 uh, vitamin D. Well, uh, that's not been universal though. In the yeah. second paper, yeah, the, the second, second paper didn't define that, but one one of them did. So some do. Tom Kachura back in the early 80s, he couldn't see a rise in 125 either. But they postulated perhaps there was a, a better receptor for the 125 vitamin D. But that was conjecture. They really had no idea. One, one other thing that, again, with the new NRC, the, this is postpartum now. Uh, the phosphorus requirements obviously includes milk phosphorus. Mm. And milk phosphorus now is predicted based on milk protein. There is a good correlation and these, you know, fresh, if you have a fresh cow group, these cows have high milk protein, which if you punch that into the new model, that's going to give you high, high milk phosphorus and increase the uh, phosphorus requirement above what, what I said it would be. Yep. Um, so that's could If you, again, have just a fresh group, that could be an issue with, you know, you may lose some of the benefit of the low phosphorus prepartum diet if you meet the requirements for phosphorus postpartum so that's something people might have to think about is maybe not going overboard if you do have a fresh cow diet on phosphorus yeah and i th i think when you start looking at this too the the calcium is also higher those first few weeks it goes along with that protein yeah. being higher i'm not so worried about adjusting dietary phosphorus I, if i was if i was working today and trying to figure stuff out i'd want to know if we get a benefit to adding more calcium to that fresh cow diet mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and see if we can really turn these cows around a little faster and keep phosphorus still kind of low basically in the fresh group I'd, I'd meet i'd meet the requirement but now you're really running really running into the problem because this fresh cow needs energy yeah exactly and and you're going to bring in phosphorus yeah <laughs> pretty much with whatever energy source you bring in yeah so bill how in, in the lactating diet, how did that low phosphorus diet, how, how, how close is that to the NRC, the new what, NRC? Right? Um, again, I used what I did was, was they went through up to six or eight weeks. I can't remember exactly. And I, I did the first three weeks and then the rest. It, and, yeah, they went through eight weeks. Yeah, eight weeks. Yep. And then the, later in that group, say the last four weeks of the eight week period, they would have needed 0.4% phosphorus to meet requirements. The first four weeks, uh, 0.36, so roughly around 0.38% for that thing. So 
their their high phosphorus diet met requirements and and so they were they they'd say you know when you look at everything in total you actually should be a slightly deficient diet postpartum not you don't want to even meet the requirements postpartum Remember, though, that, that cow is going to be pulling a lot of calcium out of her bones. Yeah. So if she pulls calcium out of her bones, she's also pulling out phosphorus. Yeah. And we've often thought that if you fed them an adequate phosphorus diet, you see all that phosphorus show up in their urine. They get rid of it, what they, what they don't need. So maybe you're not doing so. Maybe their requirement for dietary phosphorus isn't as high as you think because they're automatically going to pull some yeah. out of their bones. And there's not, none of that's included in the model. No, no mineralization of, of mineral is included at all. It's too, yeah. too difficult. Yeah. And you look at the blood phosphorus is out, out in lactation and the low, low phosphorus are just fine. I mean, there's no evidence at all that there's a deficiency based on blood levels. Bill, the, so the, the, the calcium levels during the, in the lactating diet were like uh, 0.61%. Are those, are those adequate with the new NRC? Uh, I didn't look at, I didn't break that down into the, you know, the early part of the experiment, the final, I just took the averages and the using, um, and I didn't adjust a lot of the, the availability coefficients. I kind of winged it. It would be a little bit lower than requirement, just slightly, but very close. Okay. Very close. Uh I, I was struck by that too, Clay. I thought, why are they going so close to right. a deficient calcium diet and lactation? Yeah. To, to me, there'd be, you know, with it, well, and that's everything is for an average cow. So, you know, you, sh you want to be above the average a little bit here. So that likely for there'd be a lot of cows that would have been at least marginally deficient in calcium in that, in those diets, in those, in that experiment. We should mention, you know, they did a lot of production measures. There's absolutely no effect to treatment on, on intake um, or production. So that's not an issue here on low phosphorus. These marginal phosphorus dyes had no adverse effects postpartum. So would your, so, so based on, on the findings of this study, during the dry period, would, would, would you supplement any phosphorus? To dry cows? No, nope, I would not. I, 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 no. Now, why spend the money? Yeah. Right. <laughs> it's not going to do any good for you and probably hurt you. Yeah. And I'd also really limit the by these high 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 corn byproducts. Soy hulls are also high in phosphorus. So I'd really, they're cheap and they're tempted to use, but milk fever is an expensive problem. So I, I would really limit those as well. Do you think soy hulls are that high in phosphorus too? They're high enough, so. Oh, I didn't know that. I thought of. No, I'd have to look. I used to have almost all these numbers memorized. <laughs> I'm getting old. So. <laughs> well, canola, canola became such a good bargain there for a while that I saw a lot of canola yep. in these dry cow diets, and it unfortunately. Boy, that would bring them up close to 0.5% phosphorus in some cases. And it's, you know, it, it's people need to think of, you know, the price of feed versus the price of hypocalcemia. And usually a little, spend a little more on feed will be still a profitable thing compared to hypocalcemia. Yeah. Yep. So it'll be interesting. The next question is, you know, there are these people that are feeding one group dry cow diets. How low in phosphorus could you go without doing some harm over a long period of time? My, my guess is it's not going to bother them too much. I keep thinking back to the old uh, uh, Woo and Satter papers where they fed those really low phosphorus diets for two or three years in a row. And uh, only by the third year did they start seeing some, some small decrease in, in uh, mineralization of those bones. But of course, the cows were getting older too, <laughs> so it's hard to say that that even had any any detrimental effect on those cows. Were, yeah. were those diets in the? They were in the low point threes, I think. Oh, I think they even got. The, they point, were point uh, three two. Yeah, that for that yeah. experiment, there was another study I can't from Europe, I think, where they got down in the point two, and they they by the second lactation, those cows were in trouble. The bones and are they, showing it. Yeah, they had to stop that that treatment. But again, it was very much below requirements, and it took a year to see any effect. 
and this, you know, this study here, they fed this low phosphorus in the dry period for six weeks. So that's almost a full, you know, yeah, close yeah. to a full one. Right. So yeah. I don't think there's any evidence that there's a going to be a problem with low phosphorus. Well, and one of the things that they remark about is that, uh, the, well, certainly the second paper, which we didn't talk about much, there wasn't a rise in blood 125 vitamin D, which is not the universal finding of all these low phosphorus papers, but they didn't see a rise in 125. So they assumed that the bone was contributing more to the mm -hmm. better calcium status than was dietary calcium absorption. Uh, but it could, you know, all these things that we think phosphorus is doing seem to be revolving around this little hormone called fibroblast growth factor 23. And it's elaborated by bone cells when they're exposed to too much phosphorus. Mm -hmm. And uh, removing that phosphorus from the blood by feeding a low phosphorus diet shuts off the production of that little hormone and lets the kidney make 125 in great mm -hmm. amounts. So Jesse, we can, we can transition to that second paper now. Um, so I'll, I'll just introduce it here. It's, it's an article that's currently in press in the Journal of Dairy Science. Uh, it's called the effects of restricted dietary phosphorus supply to dry cows on periparturian calcium status. And it's by Wachter uh, et al. out of Germany. Mm -hmm. um, I would assume this will this will be in the next one or two issues, uh, early twenty twenty two of Journal of Dairy Science. So, so yeah, if you if if you want to uh, go into that paper a little bit further, if one of you would sort of like to give an overview of that paper. Um, this one again was the high and low phosphorus. This was a very low phosphorus diet. Um, down to 0.15%, so lower than, than what the one we just talked about. Uh, the, the control was 0.3, so excess versus a deficient diet, or at least marginally deficient. Um, this one had a, it wasn't a negative DCAD, but the DCAD was about 50, so they had some, some, some anons in it, but it was not a negative, and calciums were around 0.7. So this would be, I think, a, a mild DCAD type diet. And, and this one had fewer cows, so they're just looking more at metabolic measures. The last one had you know, more cows uh, per treatment because they were looking at production and some clinical things. And, and basically what they found is that the low phosphorus in, enhanced blood calcium, similar to what, what this other paper found. Uh, they only fed these low phosphorus diets for four weeks. Uh, prepartum um and and um they did like jesse was saying in this paper they did not see a difference in 125 this same group with a, a a little bit different protocol did find an elevated 125 concentration but they did find a marker which i can't remember what it was a bone marker um that indicates mobilization of bone was in increased with with the low phosphorus diet so this again supports uh, low phosphorus enhancing calcium metabolism or calcium status postpartum. Yeah, no, that, that's uh, pretty much a good summary. The, they, this group has been pretty active in trying to promote this low phosphorus as a way to help control hypocalcemia. They, they have used uh, an ELISA assay to measure the vitamin D and uh, I got to tell you that we've tried that and it, it's it's not as good as if you do it by the other methods, which right now it's LC mass spec. Um, and I'm not sure why the animals don't respond as well as the humans do in those in those ELISA assays, uh, but they always seem to be off by a bit. Um, so irregardless of that, that's just a technical thing to be aware of. The cross laps uh protein you're looking for in bone is supposed to be a measure of osteoclastic resorption so if that goes that goes up you're in good shape i'm not i'm not familiar with that with that cross laps well annette lee's a gang led the charge on this and that's a researcher in uh, zurich switzerland and uh she looked at a lot of different 
portions of the collagen uh, molecules in bone. So theoretically, when an osteoclast is activated, it chews up the collagen and spits out these fragments of collagen into the blood. And so, and also it shows up in the urine. So you can measure these fragments. Some of the fragments are more associated with bone formation than they are with bone resorption. So you have to separate those out. And Annette showed that this one there, it's CTX is their abbreviation. It's a, it's a one portion of the collagen molecule. It's only seen during bone resorption. So it, it seems to be, a, it's much more sensitive. You may be familiar, Clay, when we were, when we were younger guys, hydroxyproline was what everybody <laughs> measured. Right, right. Which is a, a strange little amino acid or a proline that's been modified uh, post-translationally to be put into collagen. And when that showed up in the blood, we assumed it meant uh, more bone resorption. But this CTX is much, probably double the sensitivity of the, hydroxyproline. So it's it's the better way to measure bone resorption. And again, this on this one where they were now again based on new NRC, these diets were deficient in phosphorus, both grams and percents. And and their blood phosphoruses, uh, inorganic phosphorus prepartums were around one millimolar. And, yeah. and you're saying that's not an issue. So even deficient diets, they still, the blood phosphorus was still is okay. Well, it, it would be an issue if you're a veterinarian, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, because we think, you know, the cutoff would probably be around four milligrams per deciliter, which would be somewhere around 1.3, uh, 1.4. This is about 3.1 where they're, where they're sitting at. Okay. And so uh, it's lower than normal. It's not what you would expect to see, but is it actionable? Does it require you to add phosphorus to the diet? No, okay. Des despite the fact that we may have been trained to think that we can rely on blood to predict the diet, it's probably not gonna be the right thing to do. So again, the, the benefits on calcium would be, would justify this, this lower blood blood phosphorus which is you know based on what they're reporting didn't cause any ish, clinical issues in yeah. either paper yeah and, and uh you know walter grunberg has done a number of papers now uh and they all come out the same they they create this low phosphorus issue milk fever and hypocalcemia are greatly diminished it's it's uh uh, it's pretty hard to argue against this. And now you've got two new papers that just came out in the last couple of months to say the same thing. It's a, it's a story that's got legs now. There's, there's not, we probably had no idea why Barb Barton and Tom Kachura had these problems with high dietary phosphorus. But as time goes on, we've learned a lot more about these mechanisms of action there this little fibroblast growth factor 23 and all those kinds of things. The problem is nobody's been able to measure that in a cow yet. Mm -hmm. that it's not, right. yeah, well, it's a, it's a true hormone. If you want to think of it that way, it's a, it's a peptide made by the bone cells and released into the blood. So uh, is it, it's just that the human assays that are used just don't cross react with the cow. Okay. So Jesse, if I'm uh, if I'm uh, fe feeding a, feeding a herd and the veterinarian is testing blood samples <laughs> yeah. on these fresh cows and they're low in phosphorus, how should I respond to that? Tell them, give them a beer and tell them to walk away <laughs> because uh, it's not actionable. It, it's it's almost normal physiology to have some hypophosphatemia following the hypocalcemia that we also can't necessarily prevent. Um, it's part of the mechanism of, of action of adapting to the calcium demands of lactation, at least the ones that are down, you know, towards around three milligrams per deciliter. Even the earlier paper were down to two. I've seen twos in many milk fever cows it's a response of, of the animal to the hypocalcemia. Uh, 
why why in some cows this continues all the way down to one milligram per deciliter or even lower i've seen 0 0.5 milligrams wow. per deciliter cows and they are flat out they can't they can't move um and why why does that even interrupt muscle function we we don't really even understand it but i i can tell you that the clinical ones that i've seen that responded to intravenous phosphorus all were down there around one milligram per deciliter and and that's where it's probably the veterinarian needs to really take action later in lactation if i saw three i'd say oh you're probably shorting them on phosphorus um but but this periparturian animal is a different beast. So, so tip, so, so how should, how should these cows be treated normally, you know, with IV? What, what, oh. should, what should they be IV'd with? Well, first off, prevent milk fever and you don't hardly ever <laughs> see these cows. Right. I mean, I, I, I got to tell you, since uh, before the, before the DCAD diets became popular, uh, I would get samples in from farmers and veterinarians all over the country, actually not all over the country. It was always north of the Mason Dixon line. And I'd get these cows in that had uh, hypophosphatemia and the, they'd be down. They weren't responding to calcium. They weren't responding to the uh, calcium solutions that supposedly had phosphorus in them that were being sold in those days. Um, and that's when we started looking into it and said, well, if you're going to treat them, it has to be phosphate PO4, not PO2 or PO3, which is what was in the bottles. Okay. And, uh, so that, that went, that was helpful, but shortly after we started doing the DCAD diets and they became pretty popular. I mean, there's a lot of folks using that or some other means of preventing milk fever. I got to tell you, I, I, it's been probably two or three years since I saw a hypophosphatemic downer cow or had samples sent in to me to look at it. It's kind of gone away. I can think of one, one practical question that is, again, with we, we talked about the issues of, of these low, getting low phosphorus diets. So what is is a low phosphorus just in the pre-fresh adequate or do you think it has to be longer and ne neither of these papers address this this is going to be speculation but well i think if you look at the german paper uh grunberg's paper they only fed it pre-calving for four um, weeks it was yeah. four weeks so and then uh tom kachura barb bart and all those papers they went back to a normal phosphorus diet or what was normal at the time and and it seemed to work fairly well but, but again, low phosphorus diet in and of itself is not going to prevent no, milk fever. No, no. It's just one of those factors that may cause milk fever if you let phosphorus get out of whack too much. Well, I'm thinking, you know, if they do the other stuff, the decad and everything else, is they just feed low phosphorus in the pre-fresh, is that enough or do they have to watch phosphorus in the far off as well? Oh, I don't think the far off. I, I don't think the far off matters too much okay. for this. Okay. Um, do you? <laughs> no, I, I don't know. I would, from what, from the papers, I, these papers, I would say no. And what we know about other things on how long these things have to be around to have an effect. Yeah. I don't see why it would matter. Um, and again, that way you could save some money with using these cheaper products in the far offs and then concentrate on yeah. on the pre-fresh on getting these low low uh, phosphorus in addition to with the other stuff we talked about so yeah. so that might be an easier sell to on on economics any other uh any other take homes from this uh the second paper out of germany no like i said it just uh, it's more mechanistic it talks about some other measurements but it is supportive and again it it may the, these were deficient diets by our standards, and these cows still didn't drop dead. So short-term phosphorus, marginal deficiencies, I think they can handle it because I, I think Jesse was saying they're almost designed to, to, that way. So, And they, 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 it would be very difficult to get diets that low in, in the U.S., but they, they were quite low, and they didn't cause may, any problems. They actually were beneficial compared to the higher phosphorus diets. So on a on a practical basis, do you actually think that could we have a phosphorus deficient 
diet for dry cows in the U.S.? It'd be pretty, pretty hard. It would be hard. I'm sure you can. There's, you never say impossible or you never <laughs> say never, but it would be very, very difficult. Well, and if we th think about phosphorus with the, with the dairy cow, with the amount of feed they eat and, and things like that, uh, there's no reason any nutritionist should be looking at die cow at all. Yeah. No. Any any time of the life of a of a cow, maybe a calf, a room pre ruminant calf, maybe, but not not a cow. Yeah. I don't think there's not not with corn being king around here. Yeah. 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 Like I said I'm sure there's a few diets where it's not true, but the vast majority so. Supplemental phosphorus really is not needed very often, both pre prepartum and postpartum. And it's expensive. Yeah. Yeah. And there's the environmental issues and everything else. And, and to me, it's just not, you know, if you need it, you feed it. But in general, you don't don't need it. And I'll just say the new we didn't go into this, but in general, the phosphorus requirements for lactating cows will be slightly lower, very mar just marginally lower than what they were in 2001, just very marginally lower, but they will not be higher. So. Well, I was going to, I was going to give you some grief, Bill. You ready for some grief? Sure, sure. <laughs> so in the new, N the new NRC, you guys uh, decided to say the calcium in milk is lower than what we had said in 2001. 1.1 was what we said in 2001 and now you dropped down about 1.0 yeah, 1.05 or whatever but they're lower i know that yeah and this dutch paper though it's 1.17 1.22 it's <laughs> but there's a lot there's a lot it's a mean I just would say there, was a, there was a lot of data that went into the milk composition more, more than what, what went in 2001 I'll just all say right that. the good news is that you lowered the uh absorption coefficient so you're ending yeah. up feeding close to the same amount anyway yeah, the, the calcium requirements again the, the equations change quite a bit but they at the end of the day they're very very similar to what they were in 2001 and most minerals there's only a few exceptions where the mineral is markedly different than or the requirement is markedly different than 2001 and and hats off to you for fixing magnesium yeah, because uh, that was a lot of work. But. Well, even when even short within a year or two after, you know, the 2001 was released, it became very apparent to me out in the field that we, me, me probably had messed that up. But there, and it's, you know, give you a little credit. There was a ton of work that that NRC precipitated a ton of, ton of work on magnesium. Well. And that it makes good. it when there's a lot of data, it makes it easier to come up with equations. So there was a lot of papers published after 2001 that, that you didn't have access. To. Jesse, any more, any other take home points for this, <laughs> for this, uh, for the German paper? Uh, no, I, I know Walter Grunberg a little bit. And every time we've gotten together, we talk about who's going to figure out how to make this assay for this fibroblast growth factor 23. And, and can anybody ever measure it? And Walter assures me he's working on it, but he didn't have it yet, I guess. <laughs> so, and, uh, you know, I think try to, try to, this idea of making diagnoses, particularly in the periparturian cow about the adequacy of a diet based on a blood sample. I hope, I hope we can put some of these things to rest. Um, and I was trained that way. Um, but over time, if you look at enough of these blood samples and how cows perform, I, I don't think we need to get upset that they're outside the laboratory normal ranges. And uh, that that's not necessarily a, 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 a index that you have to radically change the diet. So. All those, all those blood measures, none of them are with cows, you know, within a few days of calving. The, what the, the, most, the, most of them are not. What they're calling the normal range. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. it's not, it doesn't include, we don't know what the normal range for these, where we do, but it's, or we might, but it's different than a you know, cow at three weeks in lactation. The normal range is different than one at two days in lactation. Yeah. Yep. 
Well, I just heard uh, I just heard Kim announce last call. So I want to thank you both for joining us tonight. Uh, Bill, you picked a great uh, great set of papers here to start off 2022 mm -hmm. with the Journal Club. Uh, some some nice uh, practical application here um, with with phosphorus during the dry period. Um, so with that, uh, I want to thank you both for help helping to kick off our second year, the Real Science Exchange and the Journal Club for 2022. Uh, we're excited to be able to add this segment to our programming and look forward to the next round of papers. So thank you both. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you, Clay. Good to thank see you again. Thank you to our loyal listeners of the Real Science Exchange. We would love to hear your comments and ideas for topics and guests. Please reach out via email to anh.marketing at balpm.com with your suggestions and we will work hard to add them to the schedule. Don't forget to leave us a five-star rating on your way out. You're going to request your Real Science Exchange t-shirt in just a few easy steps. Uh, just like or subscribe to the Real Science Exchange and send us a screenshot along with your address and t-shirt size to anh.marketing at balchem.com. Balchem's Real Science Lecture Series of Webinars continues with ruminant-focused topics on the first Tuesday of every month. Monogastric focus topics the second Tuesday of each month and quarterly topics for the companion animal segment. Visit balchem.com slash real science to see the latest schedule and to register for upcoming webinars. We hope to see you next time here at the Real Science Exchange where it's always happy hour and you're always among friends. Mm -hmm.